1412, in Dommerie, France, 41 years before the Hundred Years' War would reach its end, a girl was born to the peasant couple Jacques d'Arc and Isabelle Romain. This infant was given the name Jeanne, but today, history recognizes her as Joan of Arc, the Maid of Orléans. No one could have guessed that little Joan, born January 6th in northeastern France, would grow to lead an army and leave a legacy like none before her. This is the true story of a young French hero. This is the life of Joan of Arc. In the year 1425, around 13 years of age, Joan allegedly began to hear strange voices and experience astonishing visions. On the first documented occasion of these divine revelations, Joan was walking through her father's garden when the sound of bells began to fill the air. In that moment, a blinding light appeared before the frightened girl, and from it emerged the heavenly physiques of St. Catherine of Alexandria, St. Margaret of Antioch, and the Archangel Michael. These figures each spoke to the child, their commands conveying the unified desire that Joan, little more than a faithful peasant girl, was not only to aid in the liberation of France from under the English, but reinstate Charles VII as the rightful monarch of France. This would not be a simple task, as the war between the English and French rose to higher tensions each day, but once Joan claimed to have heard the biddings of her visions, she swore she would not easily discard the heavy burden of the seemingly impossible task set upon her. Whether these divine revelations were truly the work of God or not, history confirms that Joan herself was a firm believer in their validity due to the drastic course of action taken succeeding her visions. At this time, Henry V was the reigning king of England. One year before Joan's apparent visions, the English won the Battle of Agincourt, which resulted in a monumental tactical advantage for France's enemies during the Hundred Years' War. Because of this, the right to the French throne became a toss-up between the French Prince Charles VII and King Henry V, who now held an equally strong assertion to the French monarchy. This, however, would not dissuade the young maid Joan from making her visions of the Dauphin's restoration to power known to him and the entirety of the French court. At first, her requested audience with Charles VII was denied by the French captain of the garrison, Robert de Baudricourt, at the Commune Vauculaire. The captain refused to listen to the persistent proclamations of the young peasant girl, and Joan was sent home. Nonetheless, Joan remained undeterred as her visions became more resolute in the command that she must join the French army and liberate her country. Joan knew she was not prepared for the war ahead, but she maintained the wholehearted belief that the Lord and his saints would guide her through every step. After all, it was written by Joan and later addressed that in one of her visions, the identity of the Dauphin was revealed to her. After finally being permitted to the court of Chinon in the year 1429, Joan of Arc amazed all present as she correctly identified the Dauphin among a crowd of equally well-dressed men, though she had never seen him before in the flesh. After this, Joan underwent weeks of sessions in which she answered questions posed by the prince's personal theologians about her intentions and faith. Finding her not only a true, pure Catholic, but seemingly in God's favor regarding the accuracy of her visions, Joan of Arc was granted passage with the army and given a horse. Dressed as a man, Joan would lead her troops into battle many times before her death, yet though it may come as a surprise, the courageous Catholic peasant never fought. Many authors of today's time falsely depict the young French hero as a sword-wielding warrior, charging headlong into English-infested lands. This was simply not the case, though it could be argued that Joan of Arc's actual role in the Hundred Years' War was far more vital than that of a soldier. During battle, in her dominant left hand, Joan of Arc wielded a battle standard, or military banner. This banner was used as a sort of signal, as it told the men when and where to regroup in a safe location. The job was of utmost importance, as order is necessary in the chaos of battle, and Joan's ability to rally the soldiers of France was unparalleled. However, though Joan was not fighting in the front lines, danger was still imminent and she was armed with a sword. To this day, much speculation surrounds the origins of her weapon. One popular French myth revolves around the idea that Joan saw the sword in one of her visions and was prompted to retrieve it. According to the saints, the sword was buried behind the church of St. Catherine de Fierbois. Without question, Joan obeyed their desires. If the men of the French army ever had any doubts of the sincerity of Joan's visions, it was wiped away as she returned to camp, armed with what was easily recognized as the long-lost sword of the French military hero, Charles Martel. Due to the stunning accuracy of Joan's visions, she was permitted to not only accompany, but help lead the soldiers during the Battle of Orléans in 1429. In fact, even the most decorated generals of the French army not only included her in their meetings, 
but listened and acted upon her brilliant strategies, which were, as she claimed, gifted by the saints. During this time, the French had yet to have an effective win since the English victory at the Battle of Agincourt. By the time Joan of Arc and the French army arrived at Orléans, the English had maintained a successful siege over the city for over three months. On April 29th, protected by a distraction of her own ingenuity, Joan led her troops through the east entrance of the city and began to inspire the men of France to reclaim their captured land. During the series of battles that ensued over the next days, after breaching the English blockade, Joan of Arc dreamt she would be injured in battle. However, this did nothing to extinguish the fire of her courage. Her dream was accurate as a day later she was struck with an arrow in the shoulder. After dressing the wound and praying for guidance, Joan resumed her stance in the battlefield. On May 8th, only nine days after Joan of Arc arrived, armed with courage and divine guidance, the Siege of Orléans was lifted. The successful French Restoration was arguably the most important victory in the course of the war. As time went by, Joan's tactics were recognized as brilliant and up to this point, infallible. Joan of Arc believed that God was on her side. It was only a matter of time before all of France started to believe it too. On July 17th, Joan completed the mission given to her by the saints as Charles VII was crowned King of France in the city of Rennes. A truce was made between the French and English in light of this and Joan of Arc along with all of France rejoiced at this notion of peace. But it was not to last. The French may have been well on their way to winning the war, but the treaty made after France's victory at the Battle of Orléans quickly fell through. Joan of Arc was sent back to battle, though she claims the saints prompted her to do no such thing. This was a decision entirely her own, made due to her belief in her God and the love of her country. Out of the few battles and sieges Joan took part in during her short life, over eight of them were key turning points in the Hundred Years' War in favor of France. However, on the 23rd of May, a small skirmish outside the blockaded town of Compiègne resulted in Joan's capture by the Burgundians, who were English allies. The Duke of Burgundy sold Joan as a prisoner of war to the English government, and her military career was suddenly over. After her capture, Joan had to be transferred to three different prisons after drastic escape attempts to return and relieve the city of Compiègne. It is even documented that in a moment of sheer desperation, Joan of Arc threw herself off a 60-foot tower roof into a moat. Unfortunately, she was found by the enemy before regaining consciousness. Despite Joan's daring escape attempts, she was eventually moved to the prison in the city of Rouen. There, Joan of Arc was put on trial. Those who questioned her found her to be a sound Catholic and honest woman. But in an effort to throw the new French king's power off balance, Joan was forced to sign a confession stating she had never received divine guidance. In the trial that followed, Joan of Arc was held on over 70 charges, including cross-dressing, which she did to protect her virginity. Of the latter charge, she was found guilty, along with the crimes of witchcraft and heresy. The woman who had protected France with her life would receive no protection from it in return, as the French court did not wish to be known associates of someone convicted of such crimes. Joan was alone in her fate, and abandoned by man, and she believed God had not forsaken her. The English did not see this young woman as a faithful Catholic, nor a love-driven soldier. They only saw a convicted enemy, and for that, Joan of Arc would pay the price. May 30th, 1431. Joan of Arc, hero of France and lover of justice, was burnt at the stake in Rouen's town square. It is said that as Joan, only 19 years in age, was meeting her fiery death on a stage in front of thousands, she cried the name of Jesus six times, refusing to let go of her faith. Several reports of her execution claim that upon her command, a priest fashioned a wooden cross for her to keep her eyes upon as she was dying. After her death, her ashes were scattered in the sea and river, but French legend will say that some parts of Joan of Arc simply refused to burn. The life of Joan of Arc was over, but her story was not. On July 7th, in 1456, Joan of Arc was found innocent of the crimes she was punished for and declared not only a true hero of war, but a martyr of the Catholic faith. In the 16th century, Joan was recognized for her military accomplishments and undying faith by the Bishop of Orléans. On May 16th in 1920, Joan of Arc was canonized as a saint of the Roman Catholic Church. To this day, her name is beloved and her story is known as one of courage. But Joan of Arc is not only recalled as a woman victorious through conquest, she will always be remembered the way most agree she would have wanted to, as a woman victorious through faith.
praise you though you 